So as Steve kindly introduced, I'll share with you briefly our motivation to build a data analytics pipeline for exploring um, complex data coming out of total body PET. But as you will see, a lot of these tools can be applied for whole body PET imaging. And in fact, I think that the total body PET really catalyzed a new approach to looking at whole body data at the same time. The work I'm presenting, uh, fondly so, is really the result of engagements with multiple colleagues from our university, but most importantly, the University of California Davis with the Ramsens, um, Ramsey and Simon Cherry, as well as Siemens Health and Nears, Institut Curie with uh, Irene Buvin and Leipzig, as well as IBM, who supports um, a lot of the back end processing. As stated, this talk should have really been given by Lelith, who is not uh, having dinner at the time, but really um, this depicts him as the most approachable, sociable and empathic postdoc, I would say, that you can have the honor of working with. Lalith is a biomedical engineer and joined us about five years ago. And some of the work that you will see in a short time resulted from his PhD thesis. Now, why are we actually talking about uh, total body PET with such empathy? If we go back, to the um, origins of PET, and many of you will know this paper from Phelps and colleagues from 1974, you will see that, or you will know that PET is a unique method to probe physiological aspects and molecular aspects of the entire human body. And simply due to cost and engineering restrictions, we were limited to either a single slice imaging at the time, or what we call um, a single ring, imaging uh, such depicted in the upper right uh, photograph um, sketch. This limits certainly the sensitivity of the system and by expanding the detector ring to what we now call a total body PET, we have increased the sensitivity by um, several or an order of magnitude up to a factor of 40. And now more importantly, are able to look at physiologic pathways in different organs at the same time. And this I think is um, not a quantum leap because that's a small leap, but it's really a, a huge step forward. Now, what does that get us? So if we look at traditional PET system technology, which had a single ring, call it up to 25 centimeter axial field of view, we had to do a step and shoot approach or continuous table motion to cover multiple organs of the body, except that they were not covered synchronously. We were thus limited by a rather low temporal resolution, which impacts um, additional analysis, such as parametric imaging, or also limits our ability to probe responses to stressors in the body, such as through continuous um, uh, infusion protocols. And we had rather few metrics, and you may remember that people were stuck to SUV max or SUV, and not even the metabolic target volume has really manifested itself as a more complex, if you will, biomarker. Looking at the true total body PET, which includes the half body systems, as Terry Jones calls the competitor systems from a German engineering company, um, we actually are able to cover at least a hundred centimeter axial field of view, which is the traditional range for oncology imaging. We have a much higher temporal resolution because we can make use of the higher sensitivity. And you will see we can bring in data science building on existing methodologies and AI, and thus produce very interesting data processing tools that Steve had mentioned earlier. I want to tell you a little bit about the motivation why we went into this. It's not just because we like open access, but because we think that with Total Body PET, we can now look into um, bespoke physiological processes that um, if you take the term physiology stems back to about two and a half thousand years ago when people said it basically put up the theory that a body is in a dynamic equilibrium and whenever there is a stress or a disease there is an attempt of the body to recalibrate itself and this recalibration you can see on the time scale has been termed with differently isonomia of the, the forces of the humors up to the introduction of the term physiology and uh, later on the wisdom of the body, which means the ability of the body to adjust to stresses or dis disturbances 
And these disturbances and responses to it, you can actually measure. If you think of a health to disease transition, as you see on the x-axis, and a physiologic variable on the y-axis, you see that typically a body is aiming to persist in the healthy state. However, there can be stresses from external environment, from uh, even genetic um, predispositions, and the body tries to revert those. And if the negative feedback brings it back to the original healthy state, everything is good, but you can still measure that response. And what I have not shown here, if the negative feedback somehow misses the original target, there is an onset of disease and this disease can progress. Our idea is that because these uh, negative feedback loops require energy, that we can use FDG, um, F18 labeled glucose, as a, if you will, indirect marker of these responses. So we really would like to propose, it's not really us proposing, but we would like to have an understanding of diseases originating from perturbations of systemic interactions. So you see that with the total body PET and the use of FDG, we can look at metabolic patterns of the human body. And if we, um, if we perceive any perturbation, such as from cancer or inflammation, we hope to see a change in the inter-organ pattern and communication, which we want to pick up with tools that I'm going to show you in a second. Um, this is not a new approach. In fact, this is a paper that Lalith uh, found a couple of uh, years ago that was published in NETCOM in 2012, and it illustrates very well the role of topology and function in network uh, physiology. And what they've looked at is sleeping patterns uh, measured by um, physiologic variables of, for example, respiration, the heart rate, the eye movement, or even little jitters in the leg and the chin. And you can tell that along the sleep, a longitudinal trajectory, the interconnection between these different entities that were picked up subjectively as measures of, um, if you will, homeostasis of an equilibrium of the body, that these network change. So this is a very nice illustration, not to do with imaging as such, but a nice illustration of the interconnection and the fact that the physiologic state at a time t is always characterized by a specific network structure. And we want to take a leap forward and say, okay, we now move this whole concept to imaging and the use of PET as well as FDG and see if we can actually look at these patterns in different stages of health and disease. That would be the ultimate goal. So the first take-home message that I would like to share with you is that we should take on the concept of the body homeostasis in the imaging concept. Um, we should understand diseases as perturbed networks. We think that we can use FDG PET as a measure of the body energy consumption in this context and also building these network effects. Certainly total body PET is the ideal tool to probe this. And we should, um, well, we could, as you will see, adopt the hypothesis of the human connectome. Now, this would not be possible to explore if we let go of this me is bigger than you philosophy, which unfortunately is quite popular whenever you work with, I know there are clinicians on board, but white coated gods and there are exceptions to it. But this, this approach of exploring the human connectome really calls for a eye level multidisciplinary collaboration such as through biomedical engineers, software engineers, physicists, and certainly doctors and um, uh, physiologists and other uh, species of, um, of clinical sciences. I mentioned that the motivation and the tools that derive for this connectome analysis sprang out of a thesis that Lalith did with us a couple of years ago, and his task was to build a pipeline for qu fully quantitative PET-MI imaging of FDG brain data in patients with non-lesional epilepsy. And I was struck by the time that, that he said, Thomas, I can do this, but I tell you, I, I will need to do this in a fully automated manner because only then it's being adopted clinically. And he was putting a lot of energy in the programming of this and, and succeeded. And in fact, it's now being used by our clinicians and epileptologists. So without this and without making these tools that we physicists can derive, 
um, fully automatically available, it will never really find its use in the clinic, which we should aim for. So he built a pipeline that um, included a fully uh, delineation of the volume of interest, the arteries for the automatic input function calculation. He adopted a motion compensation partial volume correction scheme. <clears throat> and later on, he, he basically represented this in a ZMAP analysis, which you will see resurface when I speak about a tool called Ocelot. So this automization of these complex data analytics is a prerequisite to make it a win in clinical research. So definitely clinical research requires data analytics pipelines with ease of use. Now, the enhanced PET framework is composed of multiple animals. And this is perhaps a German anticipation of jokes here, pet imaging, animal label tools, but perhaps it's not that funny, but we actually call all our tools after animals. The enhanced PET stands for exploring the human functional connectome using PET. At the moment, we build it on FDG, but who knows what the future holds for other traces. And I'm going to run you very quickly through some of the tools which are available as open access or will appear soon. The very first one is a segmentation tool called Moose. And um, the idea is to provide a tool that automatically segments organs and later on lesions from FDG PET CT data. The challenges you see here are subject variability, sizes, uh, different disabilities, morphological variability, size and locations of the organs, sparse data sets, and the scanner variability, as we all know, and certainly the actual segmentation tool, um, which we chose or Lalith chose to build on um, semantic segmentation, a unit a technology deep learning. The variability can be addressed through um, including more data sets. So does the scanner variability. And the morphological variability, in a way, has to be done uh, hands-on by enlisting uh, experts who delineate uh, these structures as training data sets on a um, number of um, data that are used to train the algorithm. So we actually, this cost us a lot of chocolate and convincing, um, solicited the help of two nuclear medicine physicians, two radiologists, four medical students, which now expanded to 12, by the way, as we progress with new releases of Moose. And they sat down on, on a variety of PET-CT data sets, including low-dose CT, delineated the organs, um, they delineated the bones, and fat and muscle. And for the brain, we use the Hammersmith Atlas with um, defined 83 regions, but the rest coming up to what is now 120 regions has been defined manually. And so the algorithm has been trained for 120 organs. And I hope you can see the video because I can't see, now I can. Um, so to the right, you see a scroll through a coronal section of a low dose, the second to the left, CT PET data set. And this has been published uh, just this year, uh, was online a year ago, uh, for a fully automated segmentation of organs using low-dose CT. It works pretty well, as you will see on the next slide, sorry, um, with a dice core for the organs of about 80% uh, for organs with a dice core of more than 90 uh, 0.09, sorry, 0.9. And for the bone compartments, 85% of the bone compartments had a dice score of 0.9. Unfortunately, for brain segments, the dice core limit of 0.9 was reached for only uh, just under a third of the brain segments, um, with about 70% with a dice score of 0.8 to 0.9. So these um, numbers and success rates are, are seen very well in the paper, but for an automated tool, for an automated tool, this is a quite uh, robust approach to delineating organs um, and subsequent readouts from the PET and CT data. What's more, there is a self-correcting error analysis, if you will, implemented in this tool, which means that by proposing a, a similarity space. We can actually check if the anticipated segmentation or predicted segmentation makes sense by looking at the shape and um, the shape analysis of the incoming segmented data, as you can see in the middle here, 
And if it's far off from an accepted limit, um, the algorithm notifies us by, um, by this analysis or an error analysis. As you can see here in the uh, second to the right case, the hard uh, segmentation by a shape analysis is off by more than uh, two standard deviations. So this is called an error, much like the liver segmentation in the second to the left case, where due to a um, special disease, I forgot the English name here, but it was a soft density, um, soft tissue density representation of thorax, the algorithm thought that the liver would extend into the uh, uh, thorax and rib cage. So clearly these can be marked up by a internal shape analysis and thus guide the reader to either correcting this uh, by hand or have this, if this is happening in a training data set, retrain the algorithm. So I think this is becoming very important and could be seen as one part of a, if you will, explainable AI, because it really guides the eye to um, misconceptions that could happen from a um, either a very special case that is being applied to or an insufficient training. Now, what do you do with these um, organ readouts? You can, for example, this was a very early analysis, look at differences of normative values between, in this case, we used Explorer data from our friends at UC Davis, female and male um, undergoing the same protocol. These are healthy controls. And you can see on the x-axis a number of organs that were automatically segmented with an early version of Moose. And you can tell that there are significant differences between FDG metabolism <clears throat> in different organs between male and female. In fact, the literature on normative values is rather scarce. And many of these studies presumably because it's difficult to scan healthy controls were done in the 1980s or early 1990s. And the data pool in Japan, for example, for healthy controls is yet untapped. But this is one type of analysis that you could do. Another type, and this is part of a project we have with Irene Buva in Paris, is to look at changes in the organ metabolism when patients have either cancer or have undergone disease. Here you see in pink, a baseline of breast cancer patients and then grave the same organ readouts for the same patients are taken a year after the baseline uh, and after receiving therapy. I, I'm not um, explaining the data yet, but this is a type of really efficient and fast analysis of what people could do with cohorts of data that they have at hand and certainly takes out the subjective variability from manually drawn volumes of interest. Now, moving on, so this was the first tool that we built, the multi-organ segmentation. It's been on GitHub. I'm happy to send you the link later on, or those avid people can find it themselves. Moose, Moose 2.0 has just been released, I think, last week um, and was trained on 2,000 data sets, so it's uh, supposedly even more robust. Now, another big challenge in PET imaging, particular total or whole body PET is motion um, arising from the fact that we want to scan or we scan for a rather long time, especially when we want to make use of uh, dynamic imaging, where at least with FDG scan times are about an hour. And the challenges we face, as you see here in blue, is that we have a activity variation or distribution variation across time, very nicely seen with the uh, um, uptake in, in the gut, the liver, mediastinum, and brain, certainly. Plus, we have an object deformation as shown in pinkish, as we see through the filling up of the bladder. So these two challenges, in addition to general motion, such as from the arms or involuntary patient motion from muscle relaxation, should be addressed. And one way of doing that, in particular, the changes of the activity over time, is to use GAN or CGAN. And this was a concept that we utilized uh, in an early publication on the PET-MRI um, parametric imaging analysis, where we looked at very early time frames where you have speckles of counts, if you will, but um, as the counts accumulate in the brain, and then you have later, this would be like 60 minutes to the far right, uh, you have a fully expressed image, you would still have motion across the frames. And in order to account for this, you would simulate or have an estimate calculated by GAN, as you see on the next hand slide. Um, look at the very early frame speckle of counts here up to about two and a half minutes. But the GAN network or the CGAN allows you to estimate 
um, at least the representation of a full count image in regards to the um, high quality, uh, low statistical bias image at a later time point, except that these data are not quantitative, but at least you can make use of the outline of the brain as well as um, the representation of inner structures to then use these images and align them using a co-registration algorithm to the later frame, which looking at the original frame would be almost impossible for the very early time points. So we basically mimic a high count image for low count images, calculate a motion vector field, apply these to the data, and um, use the original data for uh, subsequent image analysis. This works very well for data as short as four minutes or less, as shown here in a, a total body study for FDG. And you can tell for the different time frames, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 60 seconds, 160 seconds, to the left, the original image with the, call it speckled counts, applying the CGAN, and you can see an estimate of a full count image to the right, which is called a pet navigator, which is then registered to the target image to calculate a motion vector field. So we mimic high count situations and calculate the motion vector fields, apply it to the original data, and thus have an automated pipeline for motion compensation. This works very well. You can see on the left a, a deformation field uh, shown for one case with a deformation field between 30 and 60 minutes, just for illustration purposes. And to the right, I believe this is a gallium dot um, talk image. Uh, without and to the right and with motion compensation to the left. These studies are about 45 minutes long and you can appreciate the effect of, of this uh, tool. Now, we can discuss it later on, but validation of motion compensation is complex. But let's just for the purpose of this presentation, take a visual guidance as this being rather acceptable. So automated motion composition seems within reach also for routine whole body and total body images, which is wonderful if we want to explore parametric imaging. Now, I mentioned the metabolic aberration maps where the concept is we take, we assume the human body as a composition of multiple organs. They need energy to keep the homeostasis. And if there is a stressor, uh, such as cold exposure or what have you, or cachexia, we hope to see an aberration in the uh, normative network uh, that we compare this particular patient or subject network to, and then we can de delineate these aberrations. That's the ultimate goal. So what tools do we need? First of all, we need a normative database that should go across age, sex, and possibly um, uh, ancestorship or, or at least geographical locations. And the approach we take is we use these original normative data sets building on the low-dose CT. We apply MOOSE. We have organs segmented. And then we do a stepwise approach through the use of a diffeomorphic uh, co-registration scheme and build a normative database, which is an iterative process. And we basically replicate an SPM analysis that some of you may be familiar with from brain uh, imaging. And with this normative database that should be age and sex matched at least, we can compare individual patients to, and then basically do an SPM approach with the Z-map aberration mapping. This is one case where we apply this from a consortium work that we have with Leipzig, Florence, and Copenhagen, where we want to explore the human connectome um, in the case of cachexia and lung cancer. And what you see on the left is an FDG PET, a CT next to it, the labels and segmentations of the CT, and look at the green and reddish segmentations. The green is fat, and as you know, cachexia draws on the fat for energy consumption, as well as on the muscles, but the uptake as deciphered by a PET or FDG PET is asymmetric. So this is quite interesting and perhaps leads to further explorations of the density and the explanations of white and brown adipose tissue that are metabolically activated in the context of cachexia. So not only can you do these aberration maps for organs and look at inter-organ changes, 
but you can go as far as voxelized analysis. Now, again, we can discuss this in the break. Um, this is work in progress, but it should just illustrate to you what it is possible now to do with whole body, and that's just static, uh, FDG PET data. The tool is called uh, Ocelot, and this was worked by a student of ours. Um, what is important for this particular tool is that we need to have access to healthy control data, which are very difficult to get in Europe. We have an IRB to do studies on the Quadra, and there will be soon a call to all Quadra users and uh, Explorer users to help chip in and help us and, and build a normative database that then should be shared with all of us to explore the human connectome further. Now, the last tool I want to introduce to you relates to a correlation tool that looks into the correlations between different organs, uh, metabolic patterns. We know that we can scan images of patients uh, dynamically. We have time activity curves and we can use um, linear correlation, Spearman correlation to look at uh, similarities between these time activity curves. At the same time, we can also um, look at correlations between organs in the same cohort of patients, such as healthy controls, and we take out the dynamic aspect where we actually look at static images alone. And for that, we developed a tool called Pigeon. Uh, the, the lady who is responsible for it is not very happy about the name Pigeon because we got big animals like a panda and moose and uh, and wolf and others, and she's being given a pigeon. But nonetheless, this is a very important tool because it allows to do inter-organ network analysis. And we use uh, so-called court plots where you see to the right a number of organs that are connected and the uh, um, thickness of the connection lines is a, a description of the uh, severity or the strength of the correlation. And what we use this for, I apologize for the small print, is again going back to the cachexia. Here you see four panels, adrenal gland functionality, which you can think of as a stressor or stress-related marker. A gluteus is a muscle connectivity, which plays an essential role in cachexia to the top right. Brown adipose tissue, likewise, a big uh, confounder in cachexia to the lower left and white adipose tissue to the lower right. Each panel in the left-hand side, you see cachectic patients. I think this is a cohort of about um, 20, I'm not mistaken. To the right, you see non-cachectic patients. So cachexia is a metabolic syndrome that um, brings your metabolism in disbalance and basically makes these people suffer from uh, an energy loss. And it's, it's the terminal stage to cancer. And you can appreciate the changes in the interorgan connectivity, in particular for butt and gluteus maximus, which we know of. But the idea is to explore other interorgan connectivities with this type of tool, just to give you a, a fancy picture of this. So we believe in the value of the multi-organ analysis of uh, FDG PET data using this tool, Pigeon. Now, these are just four tools in the making. I think they add immensely to the uh, data analysis of the uh, PET data. And as you've seen, they can be applied to any data set, whole body or total body, because they are really building on the low dose CT primarily and not yet make use of the uh, synchronicity of the application and acquisition of multiple organs. At the end, I want to show you this slide. Um, these tools are available as open access but we aim to release a, a call for a bigger community. We already have the support of multiple key players that we want to call Enhanced PET and make an effort in not making the same mistakes that we did when we introduced PET MRI at the early stage. This should be a community that helps us connect, bring in people who are not PET advocates. Um, and we want to entice people by sharing tools, data, and possibly also a teaching efforts like this series that you guys did or other initiatives for sharing knowledge. The official launch will be at EANM. And uh, if you want to know more about it, um, I'm happy to tell you about it. Just ping me.